Prophet, Priest, and King, The Rightful Heir, by Glenn and Chase Kimball, Executive Producer John Fassett, produced by Robert Karp, narrated by Glenn Kimball. The purpose of this class is not to be anti-Semitic. After all, there are no significant movements amongst the Jewish religion to upstage Christianity. Historically, anti-Semitic movements were begun by people like Appion from Alexandria, who lived at the time of Jesus. The name Appion comes from the name Apis, which was the bull god of the Egyptians. Appion, in his office as Greek grammarian and sophist from the prestigious schools of Alexandria, was chiefly an itinerant lecturer on Homer. After all, the schools of Alexandria were built by the Greeks. He was very critical of the Jews all his life, though he was Jewish. That made him unpopular in Alexandria that had a large population of Jews during the life of Jesus. Philo said that there were as many as a million Jews in Alexandria during his lifetime, which extended from 20 B.C. to 50 A.D. Some have suggested that there may have been more Jews living in Alexandria than there were in Judea. As a grammarian and sophist, Appian gained popularity as he traveled through Greece and Italy during the reign of Tiberius Caesar. However, Tiberius knew the Jews and Jesus well and despised Appian's unscholarly attitude and called him the world's drum. Tiberius' granddaughter, Claudia Procula, uh, who was married to Pontius Pilate, was a fledgling Christian and kept her grandfather well informed. It is amazing that it was Tiberius who found one of the great anti-Semites of all time a ridiculous character. We have told ourselves so long that Rome despised the Jews and thought of them as second-class citizens. It is hard to change gears and realize that Rome really felt differently about the Jews until the events surrounding the crucifixion. The Romans were superstitious and were afraid of anyone who could make the earthquake and the dead rise from their tomb and walk the streets. In Rome, Appian's methods failed to impress anyone until the reign of Caligula. When Appian championed the right of Caligula, to have his image worshipped and set in the temple in Jerusalem. This was just a couple of years after the death of Jesus. His fellow Jewish citizens from Alexandria appointed Appian the head of the delegation to Rome in 40 AD in which they presented a formal charge of Roman disloyalty against the pious factions of the Jews because the Jews complained against Caligula's behavior. Appian wasn't anti-Roman. He was a Jew who was anti-Jewish. Up until the violation of the temple, the Jews weren't anti-Roman either. They were Roman allies. This is hard for someone to understand, especially those looking back on these events through history. The Jews had a track record of being Roman allies. Appion turned on his own people in order to remain a Roman ally. His behavior wasn't unique. Josephus did the same thing a few years later. Appian was like some professors today who make a name for themselves with radical views against their own heritage and culture. Because of Appian's support for Caligula, it was a foregone conclusion that Appian would defeat Philo as the head of the Jewish delegation to Rome. The Jews were well represented in Rome, which is another piece of evidence that Rome felt differently about the Jews than we portray in our movies. Appian numbered among his students 
Pliny, whose son, Pliny the Younger, wrote about Jesus and was an anti-Semite. And Apollonius, the man critics of our day used to discredit the uniqueness of Jesus as the Messiah. What would our world have looked like if Appion had never existed? Josephus said that Appion died from an ugly disease that paradoxically required him to be circumcised. Subsequent anti-Jewish movements were launched criticizing Jews for being elitist. Other movements criticized Jews as degenerates from poverty-stricken neighborhoods, a schizophrenic set of critiques, if ever there was one. Other critics suggested that the Jews stayed to themselves. Other critics suggested that the Jews meddled too much in politics. Why would a group of people be the targets of persecution just because they kept to themselves? Another of the famous critics was that the Jews were proselyters, a term that could be used in describing Christians, but definitely not Jews. It became popular just to be a critic of the Jews for criticism's sake, much like politics in our day. Rather than banding together against terrorism, both sides of our political aisle would rather make a name for themselves by critiquing their own rather than banding together to solve the problem. The truth is that the terrorists can't elect people to office. Therefore, it is more advantageous to critique anything that would win elections at the expense of the people. It's an old story. It worked for Appian too. If one were to describe the Jewish people in general, it appears that they want to be left alone to practice their faith, conduct their business, and possess a homeland given them by their God. To be anti-Semitic by definition, one would have to suggest that the Jews as a whole were responsible for something like the crucifixion of Jesus. Of course, that assumption is perhaps the most ridiculous of all. The Jewish nation wasn't responsible for the death of Jesus, even though there were several individual Sadducees and Pharisees who were directly to blame. Principally, those surrounding the high priest Annas. Uh, that's like blaming all Cubans in history for the communism of Castro. Jews and Christians in our day aren't opponents. They tend to form alliances, both politically and religiously. If you want opponents, the Christians are famous for critiquing each other, just like the Jews of old. There is a similar movement in our epoch to arbitrarily distort the life and times of Jesus. By redefining the life of Jesus, factions of the world have attempted to own his legacy for their own purposes. There is a movement today to eradicate all traces of the life of Christ from the monuments of our time under the disguise of separation of church and state. That wasn't what the Founding Fathers envisioned at all. They wanted to be free from religious persecution. They knew that the greatest of the persecutions came from within and therefore tried to keep any one religion from dominating political matters. That did not mean they wanted to wipe out all traces of moral values we share in common. It certainly didn't suggest that we allow those who lack belief to dominate those with beliefs. Science is another one of those factions. Science tends to totally ignore the evidence of what Jesus said and did, as if you could erase the history of someone with simple denials. How many times have we heard in our day some scientists suggest that there isn't any evidence that Jesus ever existed? There is no scientific logic to this assumption. Real science looks for all evidence 
including written histories and witnesses, and allows the pieces of the puzzle to put themselves together without prejudice or bias. The real purpose behind the bias of science is that to acknowledge that Jesus lived and performed any single miracle would threaten science's stranglehold on what they describe as reality. Science wants to own reality. If we were to believe science, life is like a crapshoot. Time rolled the dice and what you see is what you get. There is way too much organization in the universe right in front of our eyes to believe such a ridiculous premise. Science is famous for devising mathematical models for detecting trends, accounting for the lack of variance, and finding relationships between phenomena. Why would they abandon this protocol when it comes to a discussion of Jesus? Science has a self-image like any other faction of people. Science protects its self-image as vehemently as any religion protects theirs. It is one thing to espouse neutrality and quite another to actually behave with neutrality. It is the same for those who espouse love as a tenet of their religion and who also sponsor hateful movements, such as is the case of terrorism. Who was Jesus really? Now, there are three fundamental aspects to Jesus. Was Jesus a prophet slash Messiah? Was Jesus a legitimate priest slash worker of miracles? Was Jesus a king heir to the throne of David? Contained within each of these tenets are various degrees of belief. Science begins with the assumption that Jesus was none of the above. Science knows better than to begin any investigation with any assumption at all. Then there are religions that accept parts of the three, but deny other parts. Each time a movement limits itself to assumptions, a part of the life of Jesus is erased. There are many historians who won't tolerate any discussions regarding Jesus' attributes in history. If you erase enough, Jesus disappears from history or becomes a poor little kid from the deserts of Judea who didn't know what he was doing until the end of his life. The truth of the matter is that there is more evidence for the life of Jesus than any single character in history. The explosion of Christianity on the world during the life of Jesus and within a generation after his death is powerful evidence of that fact. There was a worldwide predisposition for the coming of Jesus into the world. The predisposition of Jesus. No other individual in history has transcended all five major religious categories as has Jesus. That is a fact. We can't even get the world economies to have such consistency. Jesus remains the major prophet within Judaism and Islam. Jesus is the Buddha Isa within Buddhism. Jesus was considered one of the greatest ascended masters within Hinduism. Jesus is blended in one form or another in every culture, ancient text, and belief system in recorded history. It is like finding familiar footprints everywhere you go. If we were to do the mathematical calculations on that possibility that this happened by chance, the odds against such a coincidence would be astronomical. John was right when he said, and many things Jesus did. I suppose if they were all written, the world itself could not contain all the books that should be written. John chapter 21, verse 25. 
the Jesus described by John is not the Jesus we are told about today. The real Jesus is a much bigger story. Within a generation after the death of Jesus, the ancient order of the Magi assimilated into Christianity naturally and seamlessly. The priestly Celts merged as well, making Britain the location for the first above-ground Christian churches after the crucifixion. Similar events took place in Egypt, Greece, Rome, China, India, Persia, and a hundred locations. That is why Jesus had to call 70 additional apostles to help spread the word and manage the varied and numerous congregations. By the time of Constantine, there were thriving churches around the known world all the way into China. Constantine didn't have to convert Rome to Christianity. There was a predisposition already in Rome by the time of the Nicene Council. The predominant Roman church of Mithras was an easy conversion to Christianity, regardless of what historians and religious scholars might teach you. The religion of Mithras merged with Christianity after the Edict of Milan as if Christianity was the logical successor. We will deal with that specific topic in another class. My only fear is that by discussing these pagan religions and practices that the class might presume that I am pagan myself or teaching paganism. That is not true. What I do say is that the origins of every pagan movement began with an original belief that was anything but pagan. Belief systems tend to decay over time like buildings or political institutions. We live in a world of devolution rather than evolution, whether we admit it or not. The good Lord had to keep restoring and replacing and reestablishing his work over large spans of time. That was the purpose of the prophets. It was paradoxically the purpose of cataclysms as well. There were times when the slate needed to be cleansed in order to begin again. Humans can ruin anything given enough time. Just look at the American politics today. You give a free society the opportunity to dissent and any policy established by any president will begin to devolve. It is amazing we have survived in this country for this long, given the fact that we have the most advanced forms of communication in history. We love our freedom, but we most often use it to destroy rather than to refine Give a company long enough, and they'll find a way to lose market share and to inspire their own competition. By the time the founder of a company has been replaced, the assets of the company begin to leak out the back door. Companies tend to choose a new head, thinking that they're getting a new vision for the future, and immediately the president, who thinks he knows it all, because he's educated, and the company devolves within a generation or two. Americans invented the Industrial Revolution, and now we have shipped it overseas because we have lost the work ethic it takes to sustain it. The only reason foreign countries can make industrialization work again is that they pay their people less. We have lost the concept of sacrifice, dedication, and creativity so fast, it is amazing we haven't destroyed all civilization in the process. 
It seems we always need a war to remind ourselves of what matters. If ever there was evidence for devolution, that is it. The story in the crust of the earth is a story of beginnings and endings. They appear like episodes of a soap opera rather than like the contiguous evolutionary tale. To suggest that there was only one beginning and one ending is to deny the evidence in the ancient text, archaeology, paleontology, and the entire crust of the earth. Good thing that there were cataclysms in history, or humans would not be here today. We just can't seem to keep the vision alive, and that applies as much to the life of Jesus as anything else. The prophets predicted a model of devolution and destruction, which is the clearest message from our past. When will we learn how to sustain and strengthen civilization over a long period of time? Certainly, the rising criticism of national politics is more a function of our destructive tendencies than our need to reform. How many of our politicians or theologians would tell you anything in order to rise to power? The ultimate conclusion for that behavior is too terrible to countenance. The Jews were not the parent religion. We must make an observation from the outset. The Hebrews are the descendants of the prophet Eber, and as such constitute a much larger population than the house of Israel. Eber was the grandson of Noah. Abraham descended from Peleg, who was one of the sons of Eber, while Joktan, his brother, went to the east and intermarried in the Far East. Therefore, to ignore the greater half of the Hebrew nation and the dissemination of Christianity was not something Jesus did or would do. However, we have ignored the records of post-crucifixion missionaries to the east. Next, the house of Israel describes the 12 tribal sons of Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, who went into Egypt at the invitation of his birthright son, Joseph, who was sold into Egypt by his collective brothers. Joseph rose in Egypt to power and status before the house of Israel was enslaved. Moses came out of Egypt with the whole of the house of Israel intact and settled in the land of the Canaanites. The Canaanites are a subject of another class entirely. They had 12 tribes too. The Jews are the descendants of one of those 12 tribes of Israel who was given the land surrounding Jerusalem as their inheritance. They were not ancestrally promised all of what is modern Israel. Therefore, when we talk about giving Israel back to the Jews, we are really suggesting that we give back the lands of all the 12 sons of Jacob back to only one son. The unspoken tradition of the Jews suggests that they are the remnants of all the house of Israel. That isn't true. The Jews call themselves Israelis, but that is technically not correct. The 12 tribes of Israel are scattered all over the globe and were enslaved independently at different times. Much of the house of Israel was taken by the Assyrians who were Canaanites. Maybe Joshua should have done his job right to begin with. Therefore, the term Jew is not synonymous with the term Hebrew or house of Israel. The Jews are but one of the tribes of a very large family who share the same prophetic promises. Next of all, we must remember that Judah was not the son who received the birthright from his father Jacob. That was reserved for Joseph. Therefore, the Jews are not the birthright people of the house of Israel. The claim to fame for the tribe of Judah was that the Messiah would be born a Jew. There are no prophecies that Judah Maccabee 
would be some special religious entity. Judah Maccabee merely arrived in Rome to negotiate an alliance with the Romans against the Syrians in 160 B.C. Simon, the first Hasmonean king of the Jews, wasn't a prophet either. His political distinction in 141 B.C. was that he petitioned and received a Roman political resolution that made him the recognized king of the Jews. Simon himself said that he would be king until the coming of a suitable prophet. Hanukkah is not a celebration of Israel, but merely a celebration of the Jews. Other modern Jewish traditions have taken precedence over traditional House of Israel holidays and Jubilees. Both Jews and Christians alike believe that Jesus was a suitable prophet. In fact, the greatest prophet in history. The problem came when Jesus was born and the Hasmonean dynasty didn't give the throne of David back to Jesus, the rightful prophet, priest, and king. In their defense, Jesus had been gone for most of his life. However, it wasn't merely the fact that Jesus could perform miracles that agitated the Sadducees and Pharisees. It was jealousy. They were afraid that Jesus would usurp the monarchy from Herod, who was paying the wages of the civic Sadducean authorities. Most of Christianity still believes that Judaism is the parent of Christianity today. There is an elusive feeling that the Jews are the religion of the Old Testament and the Christians are the religion of the New Testament. Christians still call the religions of the West Judaic Christian religions with the term Judaic used first. However, how is that possible when the Jews don't even recognize most of the Old Testament? Christianity is still a faith that recognizes more of the Bible, Old or New Testament. If we want to suggest that one religion or the other is the parent, based on the amount or order of the Scriptures, the parent religion should be the one that accepts the broadest range of prophets and Scriptures. That is Christianity. That is especially true when both religions expected the coming of the same Messiah. The prophecies about the coming of the Messiah predate any group that called themselves Jews. The Old Testament contains 300 prophecies of the first coming of the Messiah and 500 of the second coming, all of them made hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus and fulfilled to the letter in Jesus. The mathematical odds that only 40 of these hundreds of prophecies being fulfilled by one person are astronomical. Not just one in a trillion, but the statistical experts claim that the mathematical probability of this happening is less than 1 in 10 to the 895th power. That is 1 followed by 895 zeros. Therefore, we come to one unmistakable conclusion. Judaism isn't the parent of Christianity under the broadest definitions of the word. Jesus was the rightful heir to the throne of David, both in terms of bloodline and in terms of the prophet status. Jesus was the rightful king of all Israel. Why would the king of the Israel be a Jew? We must ask the question, why would the king of Israel be a Jew in the first place? By the time of Samuel, who chose Saul to reign as king, the ten tribes had already been taken captivity by the Assyrians, leaving only the Jews and the Benjamites in Jerusalem. 
only a remnant of the ten lost tribes remained in Galilee because they were old or because they couldn't be soldiers and weren't artisans. That is why the king at that time of Saul was chosen from among the Jews. The Levites, who were promised the right to officiate in the temple, and the tribe of Joseph, the birthright son, had already been taken captive and were suffering in their captivity, as have the Jews over centuries as well. The Jews weren't the only ones to have suffered. They weren't the only ones to have been killed in mass extermination events. Ordinances such as baptism, which were clearly part of the protocol at the time of the building of the Temple of Solomon, were discarded by the Jews and today are no longer found in their dogma. The temple protocol practiced by Moses, Solomon, and the Jews up to the time of the destruction of the second temple is missing from Jewish tradition today. By the time of the coming of Jesus, the core faith was in complete and utter disarray, and the covenant people of Abraham were not just centered in Jerusalem. Jesus, during his life, was trying to reconstruct the ancient faith by sending out missionaries to the four corners of the earth where the lost tribes had been taken and where the rest of the Hebrew family had gone to suggest that Jesus began a new religion based on an old religion championed by the Jews is historically and religiously incorrect in any context of the word. The one thing the Jews had done successfully was to make alliances with Rome. Our tales of the involuntary capture of the Jews by Rome and their servitude are greatly distorted, if not blatantly untrue. The Jews volunteered to be allies of Rome. The Jews fought as allies with Rome against the Parthaginians, Ethiopians, and in the Roman civil wars between Octavian and Mark Anthony. Some of the Hasmonean dynasty even lived in Rome as guests of Octavian Caesar in his home while they were being trained in Roman politics and procedures. For more on that subject, refer back to the class Mark the Evangelist, John the Baptist, John the Baptist didn't invent baptism. Baptism had been a part of the practices of ancient peoples back to the time of Adam. The first baptism was performed by Adam when Adam and Eve went to the river to repent of their original sin in the Garden of Eden. That is found in the Lost Books of Eden. The Sea of Brass, contained in the ancient Temple of Solomon, was a baptismal font. In addition, the Essenes were practicing ritual baptism in the deserts of Eden by the time of the coming of John the Baptist. There are ancient baptismal fonts located all over the world. There was a baptismal font in the tent temple of Moses. The Jews themselves had lost the original concept of baptism and was the reason that they too came to John the Baptist for baptism. John the Baptist addressed the issue at the time of the baptism of Jesus. Matthew 3, verses 5 through 10. Then went out to him Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, 
We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able to rise of these stones children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Judah Maccabee and family launched Judaism as we know it in 165 B.C. They initiated Hanukkah and most of the common Jewish traditions of our day. The resulting controlling body of Judaism was the Hasmonean dynasty. The Hasmonean dynasty was created by resolution in 141 B.C. when Simon became their first king and was recognized officially by the Roman Senate. Historians have to ask themselves, why was it important for Simon the Jew to be recognized officially by Roman decree? In other words, Simon sought and obtained the official sanction of Rome to be king of the Jews. He had no other claim. Neither did Judah Maccabee or his brothers. Whether or not we believe Jesus was the rightful heir to the throne of David, at least he had a pedigree. Jesus became a threat to Herod and to the leaders of the Sanhedrin when he returned from traveling abroad to perform his final mission. His mother had been kept in the temple from the time she was three years old to protect her from rumors about her virginity. Everyone who worked with her in the temple, including Zechariah, knew she was the one to bear the Messiah. Zechariah knew everyone who would ultimately persecute Jesus. The Virgin Mary wasn't a secret during her formative years. The Sanhedrin was well aware of the claims about Jesus from before he was born. That is not the fault of the collective Jewish people any more than it was their fault at the time of the death of Jesus. That was the fault of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees constituted about 8% of the population at the time of Christ and the Pharisees about 12%. Combined, they still represented the minority of the Jews in Jerusalem. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem three days before his crucifixion and the whole town turned out to lay palms at his feet, the rulers of the Sanhedrin had already put a plan in motion to discredit Jesus and to do away with him. The Jews in Jerusalem obviously knew who he was and who his family had been. They also knew that Jesus represented a great threat to the Sadducees. The rulers started a publicity campaign against Jesus upon his arrival among the common people that suggested that Jesus had come to create a civil disturbance and to disrupt their lives. That was not as difficult as it might appear on the surface. Jesus was a Jew from the wrong side of the tracks. He had been living in Galilee, which was the homeland of the remnants of the ten lost tribes who had been at war with the Jews from Jerusalem from the time of the violation of one of the princesses of ben Benjamin by a prince from the northern tribes. There was a defensive feeling in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus about the people from the north. Much like there was a feeling between the north and the south in the American Civil War. When the political leaders refused to acknowledge Jesus, the common people fell in line because they trusted their leaders and were predispositioned to think that someone from the north might not be one of their own. In three days, the population of Jerusalem 
turn from an adoring crowd to a hostile mob based on the actions of a handful of men whose private interests were at risk. The miracles that were performed by Jesus were quickly dismissed in the minds of the Jews in Jerusalem when their ruler suggested that Jesus came to disrupt their lives. We have even seen shorter memory in the miracles performed by Jesus in our day. The last straw was when Jesus turned over the money changers' tables surrounding the temple. The temple was holy to the Jews. Jesus had violated their sacred place. The bazaar, which exchanged money used to pay tithes and offerings, was owned by Annas, the man who had arrested Jesus. Annas used that incident at the temple to illustrate Jesus' hostile intentions. However, the temple was the house of Jesus' father, and he had every right to be angry at Annas and company for making personal profit from the tithes and offerings of the faithful. Since Jesus was the rightful heir to the throne of David, it was his duty to clean house, to clean up for and on behalf of his father. Then the Sadducees and Pharisees turned to Rome for help with their plan to do away with the heir to the throne of David. The one who wasn't buying any of this was Pilate. Though the Sadducees had a piece of blackmail on Pilate, according to Raymond E. Brown from Harvard, Pilate's wife Claudia Perucula was a fledgling Christian and the granddaughter of Tiberius Caesar. Her interest in Christianity was no shameful thing to her to hide from her husband or her grandfather, Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius Caesar was interested in Jesus, the ward of Joseph of Arimathea, who had been appointed as noblest to Curio for the entire Roman Empire. Tiberius became more interested in Jesus when the earth quaked in Rome the day of his death, and there were rumors of dead people rising from their tombs in Rome after the resurrection. See Matthew 27, 52 and 53. Historians have buried that fact because it appears so implausible to the logical mind. However, that is exactly what happened. That is the reason Claudius Caesar adopted the famous Christian as his own daughter a few short years later. Historians have focused on the Christian martyrs in the Colosseum as evidence of the only Roman link to early Christianity. However, that isn't correct either. Christians were not the original targets for martyrdom in the Colosseum. The martyrs in the Colosseum were supposed to be the people who had disrupted Rome with earthquakes and the rising of the dead. The Jews were the rebels described by people like Appion. Most of the blame erroneously fell on the Jews as a whole. That is why they were banned by law from their homeland in Jerusalem by 60 AD. Here, the former allies of Rome were paradoxically banned from their own city a generation after they fought alongside the Rome as their allies. This was not customary for Roman Caesars. The Caesars used the general populace as allies and collected taxes from the vanquished. Dead people pay no taxes. Rich dead Jews didn't pay taxes either. The Roman legions were used to enforce Roman presence not to run civil governments. Where was Jesus during his life? The travels of Jesus have been found in a variety of strange places. According to the Coptic traditions, 
Jesus spent six or seven years in Egypt as a child. He later had been to the east and to Persia, or he would not have been invited back as recorded by Eusebius. He had been to the British Isles where his grandmother had been born. Then there was a series of other locations that have records of a pale prophet or healer, etc., who taught them a miraculous form of agriculture, construction, and religion taught to him by his father. And he said he would someday return to them and bring an era of peace. Part of the reason Jesus emerges as an integral part of all five major religions is the fact that he had visited their countries personally. This explains in part the explosive spread of Christianity after the crucifixion. Jesus, the King of the Jews. Zerubbabel was the first of the prophets who left captivity in Babylon along with Haggai and Shezbazar, almost 400 years before the Maccabees. Jesus was Zerubbabel's heir. Zerubbabel was the rightful king of the Jews during his day and recognized by Cyrus, the king of Persia. Scholars and the Bible itself suggest that Zerubbabel was the direct ancestor of Jesus. Looking on Jesus' mother's side, she was a direct descendant of the only surviving heir to the throne of King Zedekiah, the king who ruled before the Jews were taken into captivity into Babylon and before Zerubbabel. Zedekiah and his two sons were killed, leaving only his daughter. This daughter was taken to Ireland by Jeremiah the prophet. For more information on that written history, see Irish Prince Hebrew Prophet. Britain was not a foreign soil to the family of Jesus. This had been their home away from home for 600 years by the time of the birth of Christ. Jesus was born king of Israel in Bethlehem. Only queens birth kings. Therefore Solomon followed David to the throne because his mother Bathsheba was David's wife. Bathsheba bore a prince when Solomon was born. When David died, the prince ascended to the throne by birthright. Jesus is the legitimate descendant of a long lineage of ancient patriarchal kings who runs right through Jesus. This lineage can be found in the genealogical record listed by Matthew and Luke. The sovereign rights to kingship began with Adam when he was given dominion over all the earth. The minion is the same as sovereign rule, and this crown is hereditary to the firstborn of successive generations. Beginning with Adam, the patriarchal lineage of sovereign kingship and dominion passed down to Jesus. At his birth, Jesus became the patriarchal king of Israel of the seed of David. The genealogical lineage of Jesus in the two Gospels is verified by the writings of Josephus, who reported that King Herod destroyed all genealogical records in Jerusalem, destroyed so that no one else could lay a better claim on the throne of David than himself. Of course, we know that he did this to keep any Jewish Messiah from ever arising and claiming birthrights to the throne of David. Jesus was declared by angelic announcement to not only be the son of David, but also the Lord Messiah. Jesus was patriarchal king of Jerusalem and Israel, king of the Jews. David was the seed of Jesse according to the genealogical record of Matthew and Luke. David is also called Patriarch. Said, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the Patriarchal David, that he is both dead and buried, 
and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Acts chapter 2, verse 29. Both the tomb of David was there and his heir was too. Paul wasn't speaking of graveyards in this passage. The genealogy of Jesus. From the Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, Luke's genealogy of Jesus comes not only from the Bible, but also from the book of Kells, translated by Celtic months around 800 A.D. Of course, we might have suspected that the Celts would have the genealogy of Jesus when his grandmother had been considered one of their great high priestesses. They were one of the groups who merged seamlessly into Christianity following the death of Jesus. The genealogies of Jesus are two accounts presented in Christian Gospels, Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 16, and Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. One through his legal father, Joseph, and another through his mother, Mary. Both of them trace Christ's line back to King David and from there on to Abraham. These lists are identical between Abraham and David, but they differ radically from that point onward. The genealogy of Luke and Matthew diverge at David, while Matthew continues through Solomon and the subsequent kings. Luke links to Nathan, David's lesser-known son and goes on to list 40 before Heli, the father of Joseph the carpenter. Zerubbabel and Sealtel were listed in both the genealogy of Luke and Matthew, but in Luke, Sealtel is not listed as the son of Jeconiah, but rather of Neri. This is further complicated as Chronicles 3, verse 19 states that the father of Zerubbabel was Pendiah, a brother of Shiltel. There is a controversy over Jacob or Heli. Was he Joseph's father or was the other? Once again, this can be explained by the misinterpretation of the term son in the New Testament. Luke 3, verse 23 states, The son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the Greek word nemizo, or reckoned by law, was lost in rendering the Greek translation of the Bible into English. The brevity of the genealogy of Jesus from the Bible. Amongst others, Raymond E. Brown from Harvard has remarked that Matthew's genealogy seems to be moving much too quickly. It gives 28 generations between David and Joseph the carpenter giving an approximate average length of generation of 35 years. Extremely long for an ancient genealogy. It would be too long in our day as well. Matthew deliberately dropped those who were not needed from the list, while many others see a political motive behind excising these individuals from the genealogy. One theory is that they were excised owing to their wickedness, or because they were murdered. Gundry supports the popular theory that these monarchs were left out because they were all descendants of Ahab, a target of scorn by the Jews. Gundry also believes their removal was because the author was trying to contrive a division of the genealogy into three individual divisions of 14 names, making Jesus seem to be the natural conclusion to the history. It was quite common in the New Testament period to abridge and shorten genealogies for the sake of aiding in the memorization. Many Christians and Bible scholars might claim that since the style was fairly common, Matthew had more than enough precedence to do so as well. Luke's genealogy is considered longer than Matthew's, presenting a far more plausible number of names. 
Another key difference in the two is that while Matthew's genealogy goes back to Abraham, Luke continues all the way back to Adam. The reason was likely because while Matthew's audience was presumably Jews, and therefore he was concerned with showing the fulfillment of Messianic prophecy, Luke's was that of Greeks, and he would therefore be more interested in tracing Christ back to God since the Gentiles would be very concerned with Jewish prophecy. However, while names in Matthew's genealogy match the historical period in which they are meant to have lived, the names on Luke's list seem to lack historical accuracy. Luke's names reflect names and spellings of the first century rather than the periods in which the people actually lived. Gibblemites. The Gibblemites were the stonemasons who helped build the original Temple of Solomon. It is important to note that this was not just a profession. The Babylonians conquered the Jews for two reasons. They enslaved part of the population who could fight as soldiers and others who were artisans that could help them in the construction of Babylon. The rest of the population was left in Jerusalem unwanted. The Gibblemites, or stonemasons, were more like an auxiliary of the priesthood. These Gibblemites were able to shape and move stones in a fashion incomprehensible to modern science. They did this in a combination of spiritual acumen and artistic talent. That is why the Masonic Order was both a pious group and a group representing a blue-collar profession. The moving of great stones was a skill taught to them by God. It is amazing that Jesus' father, Joseph, was also a stonemason. The term carpenter is a mistranslation from the Greek. Jesus and his father appear in the apocryphal books as building a throne for King Herod in Caesarea. During that process, they misjudged the size of the throne, and Jesus and his father, through some spiritual means, caused the throne of stone to fit the space provided. This is very similar to the kinds of things that were performed by the Gibblemites during the construction of the Temple of Solomon and the building of the second temple under Zerubbabel. The Gibblemites were both holy men, and Jesus appears to have been a part of that tradition. When Jesus told the Pharisees that he could destroy the temple and raise it again in three days, he may have been speaking in literal terms as well as allegorically referring to his crucifixion and resurrection. Now, we might better understand why the words of Jesus may have been threatening to the members of the Sanhedrin. Jesus could literally have dismantled the second temple in a day and raised it again in three days later. The Jews knew the story of the Gibblemites very well. Paul said to the Corinthians that they were God's building and Jesus was the wise master builder. Paul continued and told the Ephesians that they were built upon the foundation of prophets and apostles, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fit framed together, growth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also ye are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. This is the true art of Freemasonry. From Christ to Constantine. By the way of introduction to the whole subject of Christianity in Britain, the following is an overview of the major events, personages found in the history of the period from 33 A.D. to 312 A.D. The persecution of the Christians following the 
resurrection of Jesus resulted in the Sadducees forcing Joseph of Arimathea, Jesus' great uncle, and a small band of Jesus' disciples into a boat which ended up in Marseille, France. Having traveled from there to Britain many times during his trade as a tin merchant, Joseph led the group north to the English Channel and into Glastonbury, Wales. On many previous trips to Britain, Joseph had become friends with the Silurian king, Avaragus. The king immediately granted Joseph and his followers 12 hides, 160 acres each, of land tax-free upon which to live and to work. Immediately, Joseph built the first church above ground over the mud and wattle structure that Jesus built as a home during his earlier stay in Glastonbury. This was to become the focus of Christian pilgrimage. Disciples literally poured into the area to be trained and sent out as missionaries to Ireland and to all of Europe. We must note here that Mary Magdalene, her sister Martha and brother Lazarus, founded churches in the south of France at this time. They were amongst the original group that were cast out with Joseph of Arimathea. Records show that Philip, Peter, and Paul, and other well-known disciples visited Britain. Seminaries were established to supply the steady flow of missionaries to the entire world. At this time, many of the royal family were converted to the faith. However, in 42 AD, an edict by Emperor Claudius made being a Christian a capital crime, which he later rescinded with his adoption of Gladys, the daughter of the Silurian king Cardac or Caractacus. He also started a war against Britain, originated by Julius Caesar in 53 BC, at the urging of Seneca, who wanted to plunder Britain's assets after the peace had already existed between Rome and Britain for almost 100 years. Some of the events of this period are most astounding. While Cardac, being made military leader of the British and was making fools of Romans' best legions and generals, strange things were happening in the upper echelons of both sides. Contact between the Caesars in Rome and the kings of Britain had begun years earlier when the king Caswalon sent his two sons, Sevelon and Lear, to Rome for their education. They had lived in the home of Emperor Augustus Caesar and were taught alongside Caesar's own nephews. That ended with Claudius's edict. When they arrived in Rome, Claudius met and adopted Gladys, the daughter of Cardac, and changed her name to Claudia. While Claudia and Rufus were establishing the church in Rome, Cardac's second child, Salinus, went to Britain to take up the British throne for his father. He ruled in Britain throughout seven years of house arrest of Cardac in Rome. Salinus, grandson of Cole, of old King Cole fame, married a great-granddaughter of Arvaragus, and their granddaughter is Strata the Fair. In 245 AD, Strata and Cole's daughter, St. Helena, married a Christian Roman living in Britain named Constantinus. Constantinus, after putting down the 10th worst Christian persecution begun by Emperor Diocletian, four years later, Constantinus died, leaving his throne to his English-born son, Constantine. Constantine beat the last Roman general, Maximin, and received a hero's welcome in Rome. One of Constantine's first acts was to Christianize the Roman Empire because Britain was already officially a Christian nation by the decree of Lucius in 157 AD. Jesus the priest slash miracle worker. The last of the three characteristics of Jesus is as difficult to speak of today as it was during the life of the master. Jesus was famous for telling the recipients of his miracles to go and tell no one. Many have presumed 
that he said this because he was so humble. Others have presumed that we were never intended to be led by miracles. Still others have postulated that the one thing that alienated Jesus from the rest of the world was precisely that it would be hard for them to bridge the chasm of belief if they had to first believe in the miracles. Perhaps the last of these assumptions is the most valid. We all secretly want to experience a miracle if we aren't already in critical need of one from time to time. However, it was the miraculous nature of Jesus that separates us from most of his real history. Historians would more easily accept Jesus as the rightful king of the Jews or even as prophet. However, when you ask them to consider the miracle, that is what drew more criticism from the factions of the world than anything else. It will not do to merely suggest that the miracle must be left as a matter of faith. That isn't satisfactory to anyone. However, if we stand back and look at his history, it is the evidence of the miracle. That is why the story of Jesus has almost disappeared even from believers. When we begin to connect the dots of the saga of Jesus, it doesn't seem to make sense without connecting it to the miracle. Sometimes we have to begin any investigation by saying, let the dots connect themselves no matter where they lead. After all, that is the only true way of discovering truth in the first place. That may force us to reach across the table and accept a variety of considerations from the factions we can't own, control, or even like. Jesus said it best in the second verse of the Gospel of Thomas. He said, a man must seek until he finds, but when he finds he will be disturbed. Then comes understanding and peace. We must be willing to be disturbed or we will never understand. Thank you for being with us.